I think I'd be ignorant to say that Christianity is the only right religion. I don't know what the right religion is. It's just what I believe it is. Some people that I've met, it's just, I've had friends and, and the minute they find out about me or the minute that I, I do anything that doesn't follow their religion, I'm, they don't want anything to do with me. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad that can come out of it. And I'm not sure if it's from religion that the bad or the good comes out of it or whether it's the people. I respect a lot of faiths and I think that Christianity is the pillar that's influenced by the other great religions in the world. La Christianidad is muy importante porque podemos aprender valores cristianos donde no podemos uh, donde descubrimos más acerca de nosotros. My view on anyone who claims to have a monopoly on truth is that there's no one truth about anything. I think that a lot of religions say the same thing in different ways. I want to start our time today by settling once and for all a debate that has been running on for decades. It's a debate that has ca caused countless division uh, within families. Uh, it has started arguments and conflicts, and it has sown unnecessary confusion and tension in our society. And so, once and for all, this is it. Star Trek is superior to Star Wars. It's true. The best way that I've ever heard it described is this, the difference between Star Trek and Star Wars. Star Wars is about getting the man. Star Trek is about being the man. Now, some of you Star Wars fans, you need to think about that. But listen, whether you're a Star Trek fan or a Star Wars fan, yes, I'll pray for you, one of the cool things about both of these franchises is their connection to the Bay Area which is where uh, I live, it's where uh, our church home is, and the connections to the Bay Area are really just cool. Uh, the guy who created Star, Star Wars, George Lucas, was actually born in Modesto, just a few miles, well, a little bit more than a few miles, but just outside of the Bay Area. After the success of Star Wars A New Hope, which was the first Star Wars movie, uh, he purchased what is now known as Skywalker Ranch in Marin County, just on the other side of the Golden Gate Bridge from where we are. Uh, it was there that he uh, developed the two following movies, The Empire Strikes Back and The Return of the Jedi, as well as all of the prequel movies. They were all developed there. In 2005, George Lucas relocated his production company, Lucasfilm, from Los Angeles to San Francisco. And you can go there today. It's still there. You can see uh, Yoda in, the, in a fountain in the, air, the front area of the, uh, of the studio. And so it's, it's right there. People still go and check it out. Lots of connections to the Bay Area. But Star Trek also has deep connections to the Bay Area. In Star Trek canon, Star Trek Starfleet Headquarters and Starfleet Academy are both located in San Francisco. In fact, the first USS Enterprise, not the ship, uh, like the boat, but the USS Enterprise that Captain Kirk flew was, uh, according to canon, constructed at the Mare Island Naval Base in Vallejo. Several of the Star Trek movies and TV shows have been set in and have been filmed in uh, San Francisco. Uh, we, we've got a, a clip from Star Trek 4. It's not a clip, it's a shot. I think it's Star Trek 4, The Voyage Home. I'm going to hate myself if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that it's The Voyage Home. And uh, that was set in San Francisco. Gene Roddenberry, who was the creator of Star Trek, loved San Francisco, uh, primarily because San Francisco was a Navy town, and uh, he was a, a pilot in World War II, and he shipped out from San Francisco. Now, one of the things that I have appreciated about Star Trek over the years is the way that they use satire and, uh, to make cultural commentaries. So it was very cutting edge in many ways at its time. It was in the, the late 60s, maybe the mid 60s, late 60s, when, when the original TV series came out. And they used satire to uh, bring to our attention some of the realities that existed and the issues that were facing our country and the world. 
Uh, one of them addressed the issue of race. Uh, it was a Star Trek episode from the original series called Let That Be Your Battlefield. And it addressed the issue of, the ra of race. See, what happened was the Enterprise was going on a rescue mission to another planet, and they encountered two guys who were from a different planet. Uh, the name of the planet that they were from was called the planet Sharon. And in Sharon, there had been a race war that had lasted hundreds of, not just thousands, millennia. In fact, the two people that they encountered who both wanted to destroy each other, were, had been ch one had been chasing the other for over 50,000 years. So these dudes lived a long time. 50,000 years that this race war on this planet had been going on. And the reason that these two guys hated each other was because they were from two different races. And they couldn't get along because they looked differently on the outside and they thought that that difference made one superior to the other. And you want to see what they look like? They look like this. Can you not tell the difference? They're both half black and half white. And you know what they call each other to insult each other? One of them will call the other one a half black, and the other one will call the other one a half white. I mean, really, it was kind of ridiculous what they were doing, but it was also addressing a very serious issue. I mean, it was just basically saying, look how ridiculous... Everyone else in, in, on the Enterprise thought that this was the most ridiculous fight that you could possibly have because the left side is black and the right side is white as opposed to the other race where the left side is white and the right side is black. But they created this in this form of satire. They, they created a, a satire, a satirical a situation uh, because you know one of the things that we've always used is satire to help us grow as a, as a society. Um, it allows us to explore issues that are serious, but explore them in a way that is both hilarious and serious at the same time. But recently, I have really started to wonder if we haven't lost our ability to recognize satire. Like, do we still know what satire looks like? And because of this, I worry that we are losing our ability to see the difference between satire, what is satire, and what is real, the real reporting of news. In 2015, a Pew Research poll found out that 10% of adults get their news or got their news from The Daily Show, which was a satirical news show. Now think about this. That's the same percentage of people who get their news from other news outlets like The Wall Street Journal, or USA Today. On the show, The Colbert Report, a comedian Steve Colbert assumed the character of a conservative news, uh, a cable news host. Now, the show was satirical, but he used his real name as the character, like he played himself as a character in the show. So was it real or was it not? In fact, researchers found that some people regularly believed that Colbert's performances were a sincere, a sincere expression of his political beliefs. So is it any wonder that today nearly two-thirds of Americans see fake news and with it satire as causing a great deal of confusion? So, you know, when we hear these statistics, you can't help but think that maybe many of your and my, our friends and neighbors, many, many of you who may be joining us for this Explore God series for the first time, maybe even some of you that call Grace Point Church your home or regularly attend another church, have been introduced to and actually believe in what was satirical commentary or a caricature of God rather than in who God really is. And is it possible that because of that, there's this disconnect, whether it's emotional or intellectual or, or, or spiritual or whatever, but there's this disconnect between the God of the Bible and whatever it is that 
we may have come to the conclusion or may think about who God is. So we're here today in week four of our series, Explore God, where we've been joining in with hundreds of other churches throughout the Bay Area, partnered with them to address seven big questions that people have about God and about purpose and about faith. And over the last few weeks, we've been diving into some questions like, is there a God or why does God allow pain and suffering? And if you've missed any of those, I want to invite you to go to our website, wearegracepoint.com. Click the link that says podcast and you can catch up on any of the previous episodes. But today, what we're going to look at today is the question, is Christianity too exclusive? And the reason that we're talking about this today is because this is one of the complaints that many people have about Christianity. So what I'd like to do is to ask us, all of us, over this short time that we're going to be here together today, for just a little while, is to open ourselves up to questioning our beliefs. This is whether you are a a Christian or not, whether you have been a Christian all your life or you're a new Christian or you've, you've never wanted anything to do with Christianity, that just for a few minutes, as we're spending this time together, that we would put aside um, our, con- our conviction of whatever it is we believe. And for just a while, let's listen to God in his own words tell us about who he is. Let him speak for himself because what I believe is that if we listen to what God has to say for himself, that we'll find something there that maybe we've never seen before and that we never thought was imaginable. So let me set the stage for this passage of scripture that we're going to look at where God is actually talking and we hear his words that he's saying. It's one of it's comes shortly after one of the most famous events in history. And this is history, not just uh, recorded by the Bible, but uh, out extra biblical or outside of the Bible uh, records show that this actually happened. Uh, but God uses a man named Moses to lead his people, the, the, the Israelites, out of uh, slavery in Egypt that they had, where they had been slaves for 400 years. He gets the Egyptians to not just let them leave Egypt, but they also, the Egyptians also give them all of their wealth, all of their stuff, like they would just be you know, walking by houses, they're, they're leaving Egypt, and people would just hand them their stuff. And so... They leave there. God miraculously leads them through the Red Sea and forever separating them from Egypt and not having to worry about the Egyptians coming after them. He gives them a cloud by day to, to, to uh, keep them not so hot under the sun. He gives them a pillar of light by night. He gives them food to eat. He gives them water to drink and he leaves, leads them safely to the foot of the mountains where they're safe. And after all of that, after all those things that God took them through, do you know what the Israelites do? Do they go and worship the God that saved them? No. They build a golden statue of a calf, and then they start to worship that. That's what they start worshiping. And it's like, seriously? Like God takes you through all of this, does all of this for you, And then you just turn around and abandon him. You turn around and insult him. This is what you're going to do. And listen, some of us know what this is like, right? Some of us know, like some of you already have a picture in your head of a person that you helped out, that you helped them get a job, you helped them get a house, you helped them get a wife or a husband, right? And then at the end of all that, somehow you ended up being the bad guy. Remember how you felt? That's how God must have felt, that he did all of that and he still ended up being the bad guy. And so there's this conversation that happens between God and Moses about what God's going to do in response to what the people did. And when you read that, you can go actually go into the uh, biblical book of Exodus and you can read this, the, the conversation and the tension between God and Moses about what God was going to do because of as his response to the people. And listen, that tension there and some of the words that were being said back and forth were not pleasant. But at the end of the conversation, 
God makes this beautiful and powerful declaration of his love. In fact, the words that he would say would be quoted and quoted over and over again all throughout Scripture. These are God's own words. Listen to what God said. It says, The Lord passed in front of Moses calling out, and he says this, Yahweh the Lord. Yahweh is a word that means God. It's God's name. He says, Yahweh the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger. Have you ever met somebody who was slow to anger? Now, I have to admit, I am not slow to anger. I'm not quick to anger, but I get to anger at a pretty brisk pace sometimes. But I'm not slow to anger. Do you know anyone who's slow to anger? I had an uncle. He passed away a few years ago, but he was a great guy. Everybody loved him. And he was one guy who was slow to anger. You never, ever saw it. Like, you had to really, really screw up multiple times over and over and over and over again for him to respond to, or to react to it. And he was like the classic slow to anger guy. And so when God says, I am slow to anger, I can just imagine what that is like. God is saying he's slow to anger. He doesn't retaliate. He doesn't jump right back in there. He's, 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 it's slow. It takes him a while to get to anger. He says, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. Unfailing love. You know what that means? That means that His love is there even when you don't feel it. His love is there even when you don't see it. His love is there even when it looks like what's happening is something that someone a, that a God who doesn't have love would allow to happen, he's saying, no, listen, you won't see it. My love is there. It doesn't fail. It is always faithful. And it's going to last through a thousand generations that I'm going to be faithful. See, what God is saying here is very simply this. He's faithful, always faithful to his people. Always. And then listen to what he says next. He says, I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. In other words, the compassion, the mercy, that, that slow to anger, that unfailing love, it's there for us even when we rebel. Even when we do what he tells us not to do. Even when we sin, he is still full of compassion and mercy. He is still slow to anger. His love is still unfailing even when we do those things. Listen, whether you believe in God or not, isn't this what we all hope that God would be like? Isn't this what we all wish that if there was a God out there that he would be like this? And God is saying, this is who I am. But that's not the end of, of, of what God says. Listen to how he ends it. He says, but, and you know, when someone is saying something nice and then they say, but, you know, there's always something interesting coming after it. God says, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations. And here's the problem that we run into. If you're a Christian, your tendency, our tendency, is to push aside these words because it makes God seem harsh and vindictive. But if you're not a Christian, or if you're a Christian that's questioning your faith, then these words are the words you actually focus on in this passage because they make God seem so harsh and vindictive. And I get it. It's like, so I mess up, and not only are you going to punish me, but you're going to punish my children, my grandchildren, third and fourth. So even my great-grandchildren, you're going to punish? Come on, man, that ain't right. They didn't do anything. Punish me, but why is it going to keep going? And when we evaluate what God is saying here, 
What we have to recognize is, is that we can't do one or the other. We can't do either one of those. We can't dismiss what God is saying, right? We can't just gloss over it. But we also can't focus only on what he said there at the end. We have to look at both, both ways. Consider both. That God is a God of love, unfailing love. He's a God of compassion. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of commitment. And he is a God that does not allow injustice to be ignored. And listen, I think all of us would say and would agree that that's a good thing, right? Because we don't want to see injustice. We hate seeing injustice in the world. We don't want to see the guilty go off scot-free when they're actually guilty. So maybe the problem is, is in our definition of guilty. Because guilty here as it's used simply means anything that goes against the shalom of God. Now, shalom is one of those words that, you know, for me, it's just always stuck. And I just love the, the word shalom. I love the fact that it has such a deep meaning that, uh, that it's, if someone says, what's the translation of shalom, the, the automatic translation that you would hear is peace. But it goes deeper than that. It's not like peace. It's not just peace as in after a war, there's a cessation of hostilities, and so now there's peace. But it's more than that. You see, shalom implies wholeness. It implies completeness. In fact, shalom has an implication that this wholeness and completeness is permanent. Permanent wholeness and completeness. It's not, tra- it's not transitory. It's not temporary. It's permanent. Best definition I've ever heard of shalom is this. Shalom means nothing missing, nothing broken. Think about that for a minute. Imagine one area of your life, whatever it is, your finances, your health, your relationships, whatever area of your life. Now imagine for a minute that whatever area of life you're struggling in, that for a minute, imagine what it would be like to have shalom. That in that area of your life, there would be nothing missing and nothing broken. Nothing missing, nothing broken in that area of your life. That is the shalom of God. And so anything that comes against that, against God's shalom, Scripture calls the guilty. And so when God says, I will not excuse the guilty, he's saying very clearly that he will not allow humanity's destruction of his shalom to continue. He will not allow injustice to continue. He is going to do something about it. So could it be that so many people over the years have been introduced to a satirical version, a caricature of God, The people have portrayed him as an angry God, a God that's indifferent to our suffering, a God that is distant and uncaring, even when he reveals himself to be a God of mercy and a God of compassion and a God of justice. He reveals himself to be a God who is slow to anger and who has unfailing, unending love. Notice what God doesn't do. God doesn't lower his standards, right? Just because the people failed to meet them, God doesn't lower them. The law remains the law, and God's character doesn't change. But the law imposes a standard that is impossible for us to live out. We know it is. But then Jesus comes, and he was able to perfectly live into those standards. And then he provided a way for us to recover from failing to meet God's standards. So when people talk about the exclusivity of Christianity, they're talking about a Christianity that is based more on a caricature rather than on truth. In fact, I'd like to talk about these three conclusions that people have come to because of believing in this caricature of this angry, vengeful God instead of the God who 
God reveals himself to be in the scriptures. The first conclusion is this, that God only lets those who follow the rules into heaven. This is absolutely wrong. Because first of all, it's not about the rules. With Jesus, it wasn't about the rules. Look, most Christians try to follow the rules. All Christians fail. See, Christianity isn't about following the rules. What it's really about is the good news of Jesus, which says that because we can't follow the rules perfectly, and because we don't do that, there's a price to be paid that Jesus paid that price for us. And then Jesus makes this invitation to accept what he did for us. He makes that invitation to anyone. Anyone who makes the decision to put their faith and trust in him receives that from him. Now, isn't that good news? That's not bad news. The second conclusion is this, is that God's church exists to be the morality police enforcing their moral rules on everyone. Well, first of all, Scripture clearly teaches that we're only supposed to enforce the rules amongst other Christians. We have no business going out into the world and trying to enforce those rules. But look, the answer, yes, Christians have moral standards. The thing is, is that while Christians have moral standards, Christians did not set those moral standards. They were set by a God of compassion and mercy and unfailing love who put them into place because first, God knows us better than we know ourselves and so God knows how we operate best. And look, I'll be the first to acknowledge that many people carrying the Christian banner have used the moral standards to do serious damage to non-Christians, to do serious damage to Christians. But the reality is, yes, there are moral standards that we find in the Bible. And yes, many of them seem old-fashioned or exclusive or restrictive or unenlightened or even offensive to us in our modern culture. But we also recognize that those standards are God's way of forming His people into living in a way that brings out the best in them where humanity following those uh, standards not only is alive but flourishes and is in relationship with him. Tim Keller, the author and pastor, preacher, he said this once, he said, to stay away from Christianity because part of the Bible's teaching is offensive to you assumes that if there is a God, he wouldn't have any views that upset you. Does that belief make sense? In other words, Tim is asking us, listen, isn't it possible that God just may know a little bit more about us than we do and about the world than we do? And if so, then perhaps we should seriously consider him. See, I think a lot of times what happens is that people feel that exclusivity Because when you hang around God's people, you're hanging around people that are trying to be formed by the good news of Jesus. And so we try to behave differently. We try to do things differently. We try to make different choices, not because we think we're better than anyone else. Believe me, if you talk to a true Christian, what they will tell you is they know that they're no different than anyone else. In fact, we're probably worse than other people in many, many ways. We're not doing it because we're trying to, uh, because we think that we're better than anybody. We're trying to do it because we're trying to live into God's standards instead of our own. And here's the kicker for Christians, right? We try to live up to a standard that we know we can't live up to perfectly. And then we fail. And then people call us hypocrites because we fail. No one else says that. No other area does, do people say that, right? Right? No one calls the Cowboys and Cowboy fans hypocrites because they went into last last week's game saying they absolutely are going to beat the 49ers. And then when they didn't beat the 49ers, no one goes, wow, those guys are hypocrites. But that's what people say about Christians when we talk about what it is we want to do and then we fall short. 
And that's kind of the difference between Christianity and traditional moralism. Traditional moralism says, if you live a good and moral life, God will accept you. But the gospel, the good news of Jesus, teaches us that God accepts us. God accepts you exactly as you are right now. Just as you are right now. Not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus did for you and for me. And so because of what Jesus has done for you and for me, it is out of that that we want to live a good and moral life. A life that is oriented away from thinking only about ourselves and our own selfishness and is oriented towards serving and caring for other people. The third conclusion that people come to because of only knowing a caricature of God is this. Christianity arrogantly claims that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Now remember we said that we have to allow God to speak for himself. So when we talk about the exclusive claims in this passage and others, one of the things that we have to remember is that those claims aren't made by humans. We don't make that claim. Jesus himself makes those claims about himself, and yes, they seem to be oftentimes very exclusive. I've got a, a list here of things that Jesus said about himself. He says that he's the son of God. He says that he's the son of man, that he's the giver of eternal life, that he's the one who forgives sin, that he's the light of the world, that he's the savior of the world, that he's the Messiah that has come, that he is the healer and the greatest claim that he's made. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. This isn't Christians making that claim. This is Jesus himself making that claim. So I guess, really, we can't avoid coming to the conclusion that Christianity does make some very exclusive claims. But you see, those claims aren't made out of any sense of self-righteousness or any posture of superiority. We don't believe that. I think the best way to describe it is to say that Christianity is exclusively inclusive. Exclusively inclusive. The new life that Jesus offers, yes, comes exclusively through him, but it is inclusively offered to everybody. Regardless of race, color, or creed, it's offered to everybody. Regardless of age, sex, or physical location, it's, re it's offered to everybody. Regardless of your education or your net worth, it's offered to everybody. Regardless of what you've done in the past, what, you, what you're doing right now or what you have planned to do for the future, everyone, every single person is a person that Jesus offers eternal life. Everyone, exactly as you are. Jesus never says change and then come. Often what happens is when people come, they change. Not because they feel guilty, but because something happens in your life. When Jesus is in your life. So when you think about God and, and, and think about his story and how Christianity is connected to all that, do your views reflect a satirical caricature of God? Or do your views give God himself space to speak? Because while we admit there is some exclusivity to Christianity. Listen, every religious system has some exclusivity. In fact, even secular systems, all secular systems, have some exclusivity. But the gospel, the good news of Jesus, tells us that through his life and through his death and through his resurrection, he has defeated sin, he has defeated death, He's telling us that he's making all things new, that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and Jesus makes this invitation to everyone. 
Jesus is making this invitation to you today. It's an invitation that is received, not earned. It's exclusively offered by Jesus, but it is inclusively offered to everyone. In fact, listen to what the Apostle Paul would write, or uh, Peter would write when talking about this. He says, this means that contrary to man's perspective, the Lord is not late with his promise to return as some measure, late, as some measure lateness, but rather his delay simply reveals his loving patience towards you. And why does he have loving patience towards you? Because he does not want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. You see, Jesus' invitation is an invitation that brings meaning even when everything seems meaningless. It's an invitation that brings freedom, but without Uh, inflicting pain on others. It's an invitation that gives you an identity that's not based on your accomplishments and your work, but is based on what Jesus did and his, what he accomplished. It's an invitation that gives us a moral compass, but it's expressed as liberation and not as oppression. And Jesus' invitation gives us a hope that we can face anything, even death. Jesus is inviting you into that today. So what are you going to do with that invitation? Let's pray. God, I know that even for uh, many who are here today, who are watching us online, who may be Christians, who may be part of a church family who may have grown up uh, as a Christian, that we still deal with the questions that come into our mind about the exclusivity of Christianity and that it can't possibly be this exclusive. So Lord, I pray that you would just allow the words that you spoke to settle into our hearts today to remind us that yes, there is an exclusivity to Jesus because he is the only way, but there is this enormously gracious inclusivity that says every one of us is welcome, that that invitation from Jesus is extended to everyone. That no matter what we've done in the past, no matter what kind of mess we're in the middle of right now, no matter what thing we've got planned for the future or mistake that comes into the future, that you love us just as we are and that you make that invitation to us just as we are today. Thank you, Father God, for your love for us. Thank you for um, reminding us this invitation is open to everyone. For those, uh, Father God, who are with us, listening to us, whether live or later on, I pray that, that have not made that decision to put their faith and trust in you. I would just pray, Lord, that you would do what you always do in that way that you do and uh, send people along their path that uh, touch their hearts uh, to see and, and feel and experience this invitation that is open to them. Thank you for this time that we have together. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, I got to tell you guys, uh, I just love hanging out with you. Thank you for the honor of letting me spend some time with you talking about God. Uh, For those of you who are just tuning in or who are here today uh, because of the Explore God series, I want to let you know that if you have any questions uh, or anything that you want to talk about, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Uh, You can leave a comment or message us on whatever platform you're watching us on. Or you can always email me at pastor at wearegracepoint.com. And I'd love to uh, answer whatever questions you have. I think we said from the beginning that our goal here is not to try to convince anybody of anything, but to just be on this journey together. And so I want to make sure that you know that I'm available for that. Uh, just get in touch with me and let me know. If you are watching us from someplace outside of the Bay Area, outside of you know regular driving distance from South San Francisco, California, and you're looking for a good 
uh, Bible-believing, uh, gospel-based church and you just can't find one, let me know that too. I'd be happy to help you uh, not just look for one, but you know, make contact with one. Uh, I would be happy to reach out to local pastors in that area and help you make that connection. So just let me know. No matter where you are throughout the country or throughout the world, we can find a way to get you connected in. Uh, always want to end our time together uh, saying thank you to those of you who so faithfully and generously uh, give every week to um, God through our church. Um, we can't do what we do here every week uh, without your support, and so we're grateful for that. If you want to be a part of investing in our mission, or if you're part of the Grace Point family, we let you know that there's multiple ways to give. You can give from a credit or debit card, you can give through your bank account, or even through Venmo. To find out more information, visit us online at wearegracepoint.com. Click the link at the top that says give, and you'll find everything there. Uh, don't forget, if you are part of the Grace Point family, next Saturday afternoon, uh, October 21 at 6 p.m., right after our live service is going to be our church family meeting. It's the first time we've had one of these, but uh, I think it's, it's going to be pretty uh, short and cool. We're going to talk about things that are happening as we get towards the end of the year, things I want you guys all to be aware of. And then don't forget, next week after that, October 28, is our monthly pastor's welcome reception. It has good food and uh, uh, birthdays and anniversaries we're going to celebrate. There will be cake, and I hope to see you there. Um, I think that's it. It is another warm scorcher here in the Bay Area this weekend. I hope it is pleasant wherever you are and uh, that you enjoy your weekend and have a great week. We'll be back here next week with Episode 5 of our series, Explore God. Until then... Have a great week. God bless you. Uh, again, thanks so much for letting me spend time with you. We'll see you next Saturday.
Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God Close like no